uh, it will uh, bring up the views on our Facebook page. Also, if you want to see me do something crazy, I also sang a song during that as well. And uh, you can kind of see that and see how uh, I kind of come out of my shell and maybe I'm not so serious all the time. Uh, and yeah, so fantastic things. I'm super proud of the kids for doing this and kind of spearheading that. And uh, it just has been fantastic. We are in the second week of this sermon series, Five Poles of Discipleship at Living Hope Community Church. Why do we have goals? Isn't discipleship just discipleship and we should just be focused on that? Well, the thing about goals is if you set expectations, you are more likely to hit those goals. Right? If we know the end in mind, we can be trying to meet that and reach that. Anne Stanley has this quote, it says, everybody ends up somewhere in life. A few people end up somewhere on purpose. Those are the ones with vision. And so the whole point of this, the whole point of putting this all together, is I want to create a vision for discipleship. I want us to grow in discipleship and go deeper and deeper. I want to equip and encourage you to engage in discipleship because it's not just meeting. It's more than that. We want to end up somewhere. Now, discipleship has many dimensions to it. What we are doing right now, as I talk about the Word, as I talk about the Bible, what we're doing here is discipleship, but it's incomplete discipleship. Meeting together with three or four other believers in a discipleship group is discipleship, but it's incomplete discipleship. Eating together and fellowshipping with many Christians is discipleship, but it's incomplete discipleship. Even your alone time with God, spending one-on-one -on -one time with God, praying to Him and reading the Bible, is discipleship, but it's incomplete discipleship. You need all of these parts together. It's the many dimensions of discipleship. And so I'll draw our kind of attention to this tree. Um, Brittany created this tree. And usually as I'm prepping for sermon series, I have a general idea of what I want. But I, I really, the honest truth is I have no clue what I'm doing. I'm just like, yeah, it would be great if you did this and this and this. And uh, Brittany created this. And as I look at this tree, there are so many theological implications to it. The roots being following Jesus. We need to get that right before we go on to anything else. And then it becomes something living and something growing to the point of reproducing. If you don't know already, I really like trees as an image for Christianity, right? Because trees are growing. We're called Living Hope Community Church. If you see our t-shirts, they have a tree on it, and I think that's very important, but you can find a lot of theological significance to this tree. As we're talking about these goals, I just want to remind you what these goals are. You can see them on here, but the first one's Jesus following. Wherever Jesus leads us, we will go. And you're going to get to know that deeper and deeper as you follow Jesus more and more. He's going to continue to call you further and further. Self-feeding. I take ownership of my faith. Church loving. I love the bride of Christ. You can't love me if you don't love my wife. You can't love Jesus if we don't love his church. It is his bride. Kingdom advancing. We pray all the time on earth as it is in heaven. We want that. We want on earth as it is in heaven and reproducing. I am focused on the next generation. You stand on the faith of a hundred generations of believers. In fact, even more than that, if we include the Jewish faith that uh, Jesus was brought up in, but since Jesus, there is a hundred generations. You're the hundredth generation, and we stand on that faith because they care about reproducing. We must care about reproducing. But if you look at this, it 
focuses on the uh, internal and then comes out to the external. It's all about being transformed inwardly so that we can transform outwardly. And so this week we're focused on self-feeding. Self-feeding, which is the second goal. Being a disciple means I take ownership of my faith and desire to grow. Being a disciple means I take ownership of my faith and desire to grow. Today we're talking about spiritual practices. That's what self-eating is all about. And I want to clearly communicate that spiritual practices help you grow. But here's also what I want to communicate. Spiritual practices do not gain you God's love. Spiritual practices don't gain you God's love. It's not, oh, if I do a uh, hundred Lord prayers, God's going to love me more. If I uh, read the Bible every day for two hours, God's going to love you more. That's not how it works. God already loves you. God already loves you. Instead, it helps you experience God's love better and to step in to that love and that will for his life. And so I want to be careful here because the Bible is very clear. Works don't save us. We are saved by grace, or by faith, through grace. We are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourself. It is a gift from God. But it does allow us to receive God's love better. It prepares our hearts. It transforms our hearts. So whether it's Bible reading or prayer or fasting or tithing, all of these things are not requirements that we do. Rather, it's something that we do to experience God's love better in our lives. I think the best image for growing or growth in Christianity is eating. Why do I think this is a good image? Because the Bible uses it. The Bible uses it for growth. And here is another thing. I, I'll ask you guys a question. Who here has eaten in the last week? Have you eaten in the last week? <laughs> nope. Yeah, everybody. I, for, for those of you who are not raising your hand, I will see you after service. I, just to check and see. Make sure it's a fast thing and that's it. Uh, but we all need to eat. I need to eat. I, I love to eat. I'll tell you that. Uh, I love eating food. Um, that's why I married an Italian woman, because I like food, and uh, Italians make good food. So, But the Bible uses it, right? Psalm 34, 8, one of my favorite psalms. I feel like I say that about a lot of psalms, but one of my favorite psalms. Psalm 34, 8 says this, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is those who take refuge in him. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. It also uses eating as a measure for maturity. Through this eating imagery, Hebrews 5, 12 through 14, the writer of Hebrews is kind of... Uh, saying some mean things to the, the believers, right? Hebrews 5, 12 through 14, it comes to this point, and the writer of Hebrews is like, all right, now here's really where I'm going to lay down the law. Here's where I'm going to try to convict you because I think you guys are missing something here. And it says this, In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, so they've been in the faith for a long time, you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teachings about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who, by constant use, have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Everyone eats 
you usually eat in developmental stages. I like this picture. We have a, a baby and then a, a little child or a toddler, a child, a young adult, and then eventually that person becomes an adult. But everyone should be growing, right? If they're not growing, there's a problem. I know for me and my family, it, recently it seems like the doctors are so focused on these things called growth charts and it's like oh we're in the 10 percentile here and the 20 percentile here and um i could just tell that my kids were healthy but these doctors were very like focused on these growth charts because it showed that they were growing properly well we should have a desire to grow in the Lord, like food helps us grow as humans. But I want us to focus on this developmental stages. And so the first one is a baby, right? And I think we also have babies Christians, right? We have babies and we have baby Christians. And what I find funny is that when we have a baby Christian, a lot of the times we yell at the baby Christian, right? Grow up! Why are you still a baby? Why aren't you grown up by now? We do not do the same thing to babies. In fact, when I do it, I get yelled at, right? When I take a baby and I shake the baby and I say, grow up, we yell because that, we just, it's okay to be a baby. The joys of birth, we're all very excited. In fact, babies are cute and they bring energy except to the parents, but to other people, it brings energy. But the truth of a baby is the baby cannot feed itself. It needs the mother milk or formula, it needs different foods, and it depends on others. And that's okay. Same with baby Christians. We should be overjoyed at baby Christians. And guess what? They're not going to have it all figured out. They actually depend on other people, and that's okay. We should celebrate baby Christians. And we do celebrate the conversion, but then we expect them to be a fully developed Christian. Well, that's just not realistic. We're all in the developmental stages. Then, if you have children and teens, I will tell you, my children uh, would eat 24-7 if I let them. They would, but they would not eat healthy, right? They would eat goldfish and gummies and stuff like that. That's what they would constantly eat. And from my understanding, teenagers are the same way. But eventually, what are they going to become? If you let a child grow, what do they become? They become an adult. And once you get to be an adult, you've got to start eating healthy for yourself. Do adults still eat junk? Absolutely, but I will tell you, when I am eating a bunch of junk, when I uh, eat a lot of sugar, I feel pretty terrible. And honestly, I have to detox myself from that. Well, it's the same in the spiritual world too. Sometimes I'm consuming junk. I'm consuming things that I shouldn't be consuming. And honestly, I need more of God's word. I need more of prayer. I need more of worship. I need more of meeting with fellow believers. I need more of joining God in his mission if I'm eating unhealthy things. If I'm consuming unhealthy spiritual practices. In spiritual matters, we need to develop the practice of self-eating in self-eating in the right way. But I, I think there's a problem here. We're not hungry enough. We don't desire to engage in spiritual practices. I'm too busy. I'm focused on good things, right? I'm, I'm hungry for entertainment, or I'm hungry for love, or I'm hungry for justice. But we're not hungry for God. I, I feel like Isaiah 53.6 a kind of captures this we all went away astray like sheep we have all turned to our own way are you hungry for god's word are you hungry for joining him in prayer are you hungry 
to meet with fellow believers? Are you hungry to worship him? Are you hungry to join his mission? Because if you're not, you need to change your life a little bit. So I have five things to be hungry for in spiritual growth. And let me tip you off a bit. There is nothing new about this sermon. I, in fact, I have preached parts of this sermon so many times. I'm constantly talking about reading your Bible and doing devotions and praying God. But it's something that we need to hear. And these five practices of spiritual growth, they are limited. They're the big ones, but you could be hungering for fasting. Because when you hunger for fasting, what happens is that you replace food with God's word and a really powerful thing happens. So let's dig in. The first one is that you should hunger for scripture. Meaning, I seek to be shaped by the scripture every day. I seek to be shaped by the scripture every day. Does your life, is it shaped in the shape of God's story, of the Bible. Is that what your life is shaped around? I don't know. I know sometimes for me, my life is not shaped like that. It's interesting when you look at Jewish practices. Jews have a, a lot of holidays, right? They have Passover, the Festival of First Fruits, all these different things. But do you know what they do on those holidays? They read the Bible. They read the story, the story of the Passover. They'll read parts of Exodus. They hear the story of the Passover. And why do they do that? So that their lives are shaped by that all year round. Now we have an addition to the story, and that's Jesus Christ, who died the Passover weekend. Pretty amazing thing. But are you reading the Bible to be shaped by the Bible? Are you embodying the Bible, because guess what? You might be the only Bible that some people read. People may never pick up this thing. People may never look at this thing. They might think that they know it. They think they they might think that they, they know what it says, but they never pick it up. And you gotta be a person that is so shaped by the Bible that they hear the story ringing out from you. This is what the Bible says about itself, 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. You know what I find interesting? When we read the account of Genesis, how are humans formed? They're formed with the breath of God in them. And then we have the fall and they lose some of that breath. So we all want to be full of God's breath, and so we should be reading the scriptures and meditating on the scriptures and focusing on the scriptures so that our lives can be shaped by the story of God, the story of God breaking into humanity and working in humanity. The most powerful story in the world is the Bible. We want to be shaped by it. James 1, 22 says this, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. I know we've all met somebody who has the Bible memorized and guess what? Their faith does not look like they live it out. I've met plenty of people who can quote scripture verse out of scripture verse out of scripture verse at me and yet I look at their lives and I say, you do not live this. I know for me, I memorized uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. I had it in my head. I could recite it. But guess what? That passage is all about the humility of Christ and having the same mindset as Christ. And I did not live it out. I could say what the Bible says, but I couldn't do what the Bible says. To be shaped by the Bible, we need to do what it says. We need to be renewing ourselves, and really, to do what the Bible says, you've got to know what it says. 
And we must renew ourselves by the Bible, our body, soul, mind, and heart, every day. Every day. I know Miss Madeline says if uh, she doesn't read her Bible in the morning, she feels like she's walking outside naked. I'm not, I'm not sure we all feel like that. We just feel fine if we go out. But are you missing something? Are you feeling like you might embarrass yourself if you walk out of the house not reading your Bible? I'll be honest, I, I'm kind of hypocritical in this. Uh, before this year, I would constantly miss days. Right? Oh, we're going on a trip. I'm just, I'll just miss this day. Or, uh, you know, we're doing this, so, and I'm tired. I don't want to wake up. And the kids are asking me questions. Just read a song. The smallest song that you can find. I don't care. Read the Bible every single day. Read one verse. And it will change your life if you do it every single day. Because it won't just happen. You need to set a time. You need to place it there. And your appetite for the Bible will grow. It's interesting to watch this play out, the how you kind of grow with your appetite. We had VBS last week, and all the little kids did this Bible verse. Maria repeated it over and over again, and it's let us keep looking to Jesus. Hebrews 2.12a, right? Or 12.2a. Yeah, there we go. Uh, and so my daughters have been doing this over and over and over again. And uh, we were walking the dog last night, and Madison was like, I'm just going to follow Amore. She's like, no, 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 wait. I'm going to follow Jesus instead of Amore. And I said, that's a good thing. That's, that's great. And then she repeated that verse, and my, my son scoffed because he doesn't like anything that's like over and over again. And he's just like, you know what's weird about that verse? It's, it's very catchy. And I find myself in my room saying that verse to myself. And it's just, it's very, it's annoying, but it's catchy. Well, that's what happens when you read the Bible over and over again. It gets stuck in there. It got stuck in my son, and now he says this verse over and over again by himself in his room. A pretty powerful thing that scripture can do. I know for me, I'm constantly just walking around and I'm thinking about life, and a verse comes into my brain. And there's a great thing on your phone, it's called Google. You can type in those words, and the Bible verse pops right up. Is our lives shaped by scripture the second is prayer we need to be hungry for prayer am i seeking out receiving god's love every day if you want to grow in a relationship you got to talk to the person and the person has to talk to you right that's the whole part of it but many times we look at praying to god as talking to a wall God, are you up there? God, can you hear me? When you truly are engaging in prayer, what you realize is it's very formative and it's a lot more receiving than giving. We should be praying every single day. I would conjoin it with Scripture. And honestly, this should lead us to say with Christians everywhere, Psalm 34, 4, I sought the Lord... And he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Dallas Willard says about prayer, Prayer is, above all, a means of forming character. It combines freedom and power with service and love. If you don't know what to say, pray a scripture. Any scripture, you can pray it, and even though you don't feel like you know what to say, you can pray that scripture. And do you know what the Bible says? The Holy Spirit is groaning for us and is communicating to God even though we don't know what we are saying. There's power in prayer if you do it. The third one that we should hunger for is 
meet with fellow believers, saying, I seek out relationships that help me grow. There are no Lone Ranger Christians. You cannot do this alone. That's why I said that a dimension of discipleship is reading the Bible and praying and encountering God by yourself. But if that's all it is, you are not living your true faith. You need other believers, even in their messed upness, even in their incompleteness. You need other people because you need other people to show you what they see in God. And guess what? You're going to grow from that. Hebrews 3.13 points towards this. Hebrews 3.13 says, But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. You are susceptible to the devil speaking lies into you, telling you wrong things, and we're all susceptible to this, right? We are thinking like, oh, did that, what did that person mean when they said that? I bet you they meant this. And then uh, you start to have an argument with that person in your head. And uh, you, you know what I always notice about these arguments? I sound so smart and the other person sounds so mean when I'm arguing with them back and forth. They're just like, they're saying the worst things and I'm arguing back and forth. And then I go back to the person and I say, why did you say this? And usually what they'll say is, well, well, I didn't say any of that. We need each other. And then we guess what? We need a third person to help encourage us to work things out. We need to meet together. You'll be trapped in a singular focus if you don't. It was not good for man to be alone. This is not just a romantic uh, passage in Genesis where it says it was not good for man to be alone and so I, God gave him Eve. It's also a fellowship aspect. We need each other. We need each other. And so this is what I would encourage you to do. So the, the first two are daily. But if you're thinking, oh, I just do not have time to meet with other believers. Well, you should three times a week. I'm saying three times a week, make it manageable and easy. And guess what? This week you got one out of the way, right? We're in church together. We're meeting together. Even if it's a five-minute phone conversation, you should be sharing your heart with fellow believers and being honest with them, because if you do that, you will grow. <clears throat> it might be scary, but you should be doing that. And in fact, I think there's even three relationships every Christian should have, which is a mentor, somebody who has gone beyond you, who has gone further in the faith, who can mentor you. You should have a peer, somebody who is on the same level as you, who can talk to you and work things out and you can feel like, hey, I have a friend in the faith. They're on the same journey at the same level that I am. And a follower, because what you'll find about a follower is they call you out on your nonsense and you'll grow in that way. Every single Christian should have a mentor, a peer, and a follower. Get a text chain. Whatever it may be, make sure that you are meeting with other believers. The fourth one is worship. I encounter something beyond me that transforms me well. I seek to encounter something beyond me that transforms me well. Romans 12, 1 through 2, which I read last week, is also important here. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. The honest truth is, 
you reflect what you worship. We looked at this deeply last week, and honestly, worship is a re-centering, and you cannot go God. You need to be making sure to do that each and every day. Listen to a worship song. Do spiritual practices that help you worship. You can worship through the Bible, but you should also be worshiping every single week with fellow believers. You can worship by yourself. That is great and fantastic, but you should also be worshiping with fellow believers. You will grow so much if you worship something beyond yourself. And the last one is... Uh, Mission, the fifth one. I join God at work so my goals match His. Serving will certainly grow you. It will transform you. It will do many things for you because the whole while that you're doing it, you're saying, on earth as it is in heaven, I'm joining God in His mission. And honestly, when you serve with other people, they don't do it the way that you do it. They mess up. They don't uh, follow through with what they said that they were going to do. And that is so growing. You cannot go wrong by serving. It will grow you. You should seek all five of these things out. I want to view all five of these in light of our posture. I talk a lot about posture. I think part of my job as a pastor in preaching is not... Uh, telling you how, what to do and the five steps to this or the five steps to that, but really helping you create, uh, uh, correct your posture. And so I want to do that. I want us to savor being with God to grow. And I have a perfect story for this. This perfect sermon analogy, which is a couple months ago, I think back in February... I invited Brad Conklin over to my house, and I said, hey, I'm going to cook you a steak. Now, he had doubts about whether a pastor could cook a steak well. He was hesitant, but he decided to come anyway, and I had got these steaks from a farm in Lancaster where uh, they were grass-fed, all that stuff, and I cooked up the steak, a nice porterhouse for him, and I cooked it up, and I served it to him, and he enjoyed that so much. He loved this steak. He started talking about the farmers and how they know how to farm, and they did such a fantastic job of farming it. And even before he started talking, you could tell by the noises that he was making that he was enjoying that steak. He enjoyed it so much that my children, hearing him eat the steak, said, I want some steak. And he had to share the steak because he was enjoying the steak so much. Not only that, after he left the house, everywhere he went, he told people how good the steak was. Now, I don't have very many steaks, but basically what he did was he uh, gave out my steaks to a certain amount of people, right? He said, you go to Shane's house this week, you go to Shane's house this week, you'll all get a steak. It was honestly so much that uh, as he was talking about it, Liv said, hey, where's my steak? <laughs> I, I want a steak. And so we invited Liv over to the house to eat the steak. He enjoyed that steak so much. We don't talk about scripture like that. We don't talk about being with God like that. We don't speak about growing like that. It's crazy that we'll do this with food, but we won't always do it with scripture. How many times have you said, oh, hey, this is a great place. You should eat here. Or, or the opposite, right? This is, I got food poisoning here. I do not eat here. But we need to desire for the food. Imagine if you thought of scripture like that, that as you were reading scripture, you were having so many spiritual yummies, as I call them, that you're just like dwelling over the scripture and the person beside you says, oh, I, I want some of that. 
And then you share the story of what God has done and you share it with somebody else and they say, oh, I, I want to hear that story. I want to know what that is. The word meditation in the whole Bible, when I say the word meditation, you think maybe I would sit on this little drum and I, I kind of sing kumbaya and I go hum, right? That's what we think of meditation. That's not what the word meditation meant in the Old Testament. Instead, it meant uh, it was conjoined with maybe a dog eating their bone or a lion standing over its prey or Brad eating a steak, right? All three of these are images. That is how we meditate on scripture. We are devouring scripture. We are Oh, we just cannot get enough of it. We are sad when we go away. I Sometimes I'm happy when I'm finished with the Bible. Oh, ooh, I finished my few chapters there. I am done. But meditation is, oh, I cannot get enough of this. I have other things that I need to do, but, oh, if I could just have one more minute to spend with God. So think of meditation like that, devouring a bone, a dog devouring a bone. Psalm 1, 2 says, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Psalm 119, 97. The psalmist writes, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all day long. Meditation all day long. And that law is the Pentateuch, right? He's, he loves Leviticus. He loves Numbers. He loves Deuteronomy, the books that we usually skip, right? He's like, I, I, I love it. It all goes back to changing our desires. It is important that we desire being with God, growing in God. And that's what self-feeding is all about. So set a time to read your Bible. Speak to God daily when you're reading your Bible. Set up three times where you're meeting with other believers, outside of your family preferably, because you're probably talking to your family daily. Worship weekly, but also worship daily. And ask, where is God's mission today? What is God's mission for me today? And you will become more self-feeding. We're going to do something at the end of this, so if you would stand with me, we're actually going to read Psalm 1 together. That points towards this. So Psalms 1, if you would just read it with me. It says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in the step with the wicked, or stand in the way of the sinner's shape, or sit in the company of the mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaves does not wither, whether they do prosper. Not so with the wicked. They are like chaff, that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor the sinner in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the ways of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. I want to challenge you, in your Bible reading, just read that every day this week. Because I think there's a potential there to align your heart with the lighting in the law of the Lord. Would you join me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, may we hunger for you. May we desire to be with you. May we desire to be transformed by you. Because we know that in your presence is transformation and formation. May you be turning our hearts and changing our hearts. We love you. Let me thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.